be talking about self-generated sexualized content. Um, we will have a look at this issue on the one hand on the legal regulations that we already see in many countries and we will contrast that with the perception of young people themselves uh, who are in the situation that they probably face even legal, legal uh, problems when they produce self-generated sexualized content. Um, my name is Jutta Koll. I'm working for the German Digital Opportunities Foundation. Uh, there I'm responsible for a project called Children's Rights Digital. Um, and if we've spread some of our postcards around here so that all the documents we are talking about can be found uh, in our website. Um, so that you don't need to write everything down, just uh, refer to the website and then you will be able to, to check out uh, the documents that we are referring to. We would like to begin our session today uh, with talking about what does it mean, self-generated sexualized content. I do think we have several different perceptions of what is self-generated, what is even sexualized content, and therefore I would like to refer firstly to uh, our first panelist, which is Professor Sonia Livingston from the London School of Economics. And if you can hear us, I hope you are connected to the session and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you uh, so much, and I hope on my side that uh, you can hear me clearly. Um, and it's um, a pleasure to uh, join this session and discuss this very important um, topic. So I was um, I, I, I want to give a, a few remarks from a child rights perspective, setting out um, uh, some uh, questions of definition and framework. Um, and uh, for those who uh, don't know, um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child sets out children's rights as an obligation for all um, signatories, which is uh, all uh, states uh, in the world apart from the USA. And the Committee on the Rights of the Child has been elected by those states that ratified the Convention uh, to scrutinise their progress in implementing children's rights. And the Committee makes recommendations on measures to uh, strengthen compliance um, for children's rights, including um, producing what are called general comments, uh, which are, if you like, the Committee's jurisprudence, um, the, the the committee's thinking uh, on how the convention applies in, in relation to a particular domain. So general comment 25 is what I want to talk about, which is the uh, newest uh, general comment and specifically addresses the, the role of the convention on the rights of the child in relation to the digital environment. And it was informed by a very considerable global process of consultation that uh, some of those uh, here I know have been part of. The consultation included uh, experts, uh, stakeholders, and importantly, also children. So it's a piece of authoritative international uh, soft law, uh, if you like, um, adopted in early 2021 and uh, welcomed on, on um, its adoption by the World Health Organization, the uh, ITU, UNESCO, ECPAT International, OECD, We Protect Global Alliance and so forth. Several of those are going to um, participate uh, in this uh, session today. Uh, to my mind, and I think I think for, for many, it kind of marks a, a real change in relation to uh, internet governance uh, and, and it marks a real change in ensuring the recognition of children's voices, children's needs and children's rights. So coming to our uh, topic now um, in relation to uh, harmful or we might say potentially harmful sexualized content, um, which is um, where the general comment gives most of its focus in relation to um, sexualized content. The general comment, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, emphasizes the responsibility of both states and businesses in, quote, taking all appropriate measures to protect children from risks to their right to life, survival and development. And it locates the importance of sexual risks um, of harm in the context of national child protection policies and protection from all forms of exploitation 
um, also uh, in relation to um, the importance of international collaboration and cooperation. Uh, and it and it emphasizes that we must think of children's rights holistically. So we're here debating, um, we're discussing uh, self-generated sexual content. This needs to be put in the context of other rights, freedom of expression, privacy, digital literacy education, and, and non-discrimination um, and the situation for children in particular circumstances of, of disadvantage. So I, I, I think what I would like to say, I'll make one more um, point really about definitions, uh, because I think the notion of self-generated sexual material uh, has generated quite a lot of misunderstandings in its own right. And it's the notion of self-generated, as Yotta Kroll just signalled, um, which is really crucial. So I think um, from the point of view of the um, general comment, two of the key issues are around um, evolving capacity, the child's um, uh, growing maturity and uh, ability to understand and make uh, decisions for themselves, and the question of consent. And I hear um, in debate uh, at least three ways in which self-generated sexual material is, is talked about. And the general comment has, if you like, three areas of recommendation. So let me distinguish them. Others may use other terms. So the first meaning of self-generated uh, sexual uh, content uh, refers to a coercive or exploitative situation by an adult who is often remote um, at, a, at a distance and digitally facilitated from the, from the child victim. So if we're talking about a coercive or exploitative situation, then general comment 25 emphasizes the importance of safeguarding and protection for the victim, platform responsibility and regulation, both to prevent the situation and also to ensure redress if it occurs. It calls for criminalization of the abuser and rehabilitation of the victim. So the second situation is coercive, but the perpetrator is also a child. And then uh, general comment 25 uh, also calls for the protections for the victim or the, um, for the, for the victim, but also for restorative and not criminal approaches for the perpetrator when they are a child. And then we need to acknowledge the third possibility, which is a truly consenting situation, um, probably among those who are themselves under the age of 18, so children in the light of the uh, convention. And then General Comment 25 calls for a non-punitive approach in accordance with the child's evolving capacity and best interests. And then just as a rider, in all of those circumstances, there is the possibility, uh, the likelihood of creating content um, over which um, uh, even a consenting child with another child um, la loses control. And in those cases, the state and the business is bear responsibility for any and all sharing of images and general comment 25 calls for prompt and effective takedown. So I'll leave it there. Um, and to uh, others' contributions and, and come back in um, a little later, I think. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Sonia, for, for explaining uh, what the general comment uh, says in regard of uh, self-generated sexualized content. We have spread here around in the room uh, such smaller postcards with a link to our website, www.childrens-rights.digital. And there you will be able to find all the documents that we are talking about today. I would now like to, to bring into the debate Hazel Bitana. He's, she is speaking, speaking for, uh, from a youth perspective from the Asian region. And Hazel, I hope you are there and can respond uh, to what Sonia has already presented to us. Hi, Yuta. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Wherever you are, my name is Hazel from Child Rights Coalition Asia or Peers Asia, a regional network of child rights organizations. Um, and I'm based in Manila where the secretary is, but Peers Asia it currently has 16 member organizations in 13 countries in East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. 
one of the intrinsic blueprints of our coalition is that we work for and with children. And we have had several opportunities to discuss and implement actions with children in relation to their rights in the digital environment, including the consultation to the general comment that uh, Sonia talked about. When we talk to children about online sexual exploitation and abuse, and ask them about their recommendations on how to address the issue, they could not help but discuss problems and action, both online and offline. They always highlight the interrelationship between their online world and their offline world, and they bring to fore the importance of addressing the root causes. Um, for example, for digital platforms and in relation to our theme for this workshop session, one of the children's key recommendations is to have a child-friendly and accessible reporting mechanism. Unpacking that, what do we mean by accessible and child-friendly? It should be in child-friendly terms in a language that they understand. And in the Asian region, there is a variety of languages that are not, uh, should I say, popular. Languages with different scripts that are not popular in the online world. So if they want to report a uh, takedown of the self-generated sexualized content, can they easily find the report button? And if that report button asks them to choose what type of category does their report fall under, are these categories easily understood by the children? And then more on the online-offline relationship, children are highlighting the importance of having comprehensive sexuality education. Quality information on this could be accessed online, but it should be also taught in schools in order to prevent children from putting themselves in dangerous situations online uh, children need to learn about what are our sexual and reproductive health and rights what is happening to our bodies as we develop how do we understand gender and what is a healthy relationship and uh, my third and last point is about the children's need to have good and strong relationships offline with their families, with their peers, or other members of the community. To further illustrate this point, I will relay a sharing from one of our discussions with children. In 2019, Peers Asia, together with our other with other organizations, we held the Asian Children Summit. And there was the sharing from the Digital Environment Workshop Group that says, um, children know some friends. They know fellow adolescents who sign up for dating apps. They lie about their age when they sign up because they are searching for someone who will give them a sense of belonging that uh, they could not find at home. So in this dating app, the adolescent was asked to share a self-generated sexualized content. Unfortunately, one story ended tragically, but children wanted to point out how their relationship with their families, having trusted adults and friends, impact uh, children's engagement online. And it should also be worth noting that, especially for adolescents, brain science has proven that adolescence is a period of transition, where adolescents are in a rapid curve of development, as mentioned in another general comment of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, general comment number 20 on rights of the child during adolescence. And during that brain development, the emotional part of the brain matures earlier than the rational part of the brain, so the adolescent's brains are wired to think emotionally first before thinking rationally. And this should be taken into consideration when we talk about the digital well-being of children and youth who see the advantages of the digital environment as a platform for them to express their ideas, connect with their peers, um, and exchange uh, with, with the people in, in the online world. So I'll end with that and yeah, back to you, you yeah, thank you so much, Hazel, for giving us an insight into the the research that you are doing and the Asian uh, Pacific region perception of, of children uh, in this regard. Before we come to the question, which answers does legislation provide, I would like to invite you to ask questions to the first two speakers, if you have some. Uh, and I also would like to refer to my co-moderator online, Sophie Pohle from the German Children's uh, Charity Fund. Sophie, do we already have questions in the chat? Hello, everybody. Hello, Jutta. Um, not so far. There are no questions at the moment, but um, yeah, you're invited to put a comment 
or a question also in the chat tool, for example. Hello. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for for the uh, for your talk. My question um, is um, about what you think is the responsibility of big tech companies, because um, when when there is an uh, exploitation going online, there are IP addresses, signals, imprints of actually those exploiters, and all of the big tech companies have total access to a lot of data, a lot of insights about who these people are and how it is happening. So, what would your suggestion be on? Um, engaging those companies and holding them accountable for this matter. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for this very <coughs> relevant question. If you allow, I would postpone it a little bit so that we first hear what legislation is around, what legislation says in this regard, and whether there are obligations to the platform providers in various countries. And we are lucky to have Joyas Capucci from the Council of Europe here uh, telling us uh, about the Council of Europe's implementation report, uh, which gives an overview on the legislation in 43 countries around the world, and it clusters uh, the very best legislative approaches, but also maybe pitfalls. Joya, are you there? And then I would hand over the floor to you, please. Yes, I am here and I'm delighted to be with you all today. Hello everyone all around the globe. Uh, I'm uh, honored to present the main findings of the Lanzarote Committee's latest monitoring report, which indeed uh, focuses on how states uh, which were examined in this report, which were 43 states uh, over uh, Europe who are parties to the Lanzarote Convention, which is a Council of Europe Convention, but which is open also to non-European countries. So if there are any questions about that, I can reply to that later on. Uh, this report was adopted in March last year, and its main focus was trying to understand what is in place in, in these countries in order to uh, tackle the challenges raised by child self-generated sexual images and videos in particular. As Sonia said previously, one must be very careful with uh, the terminology and the identification uh, of different uh, kinds of self-generated uh, child images of a sexual nature. And the Lanzarote Committee indeed uh, has uh, also made uh, that distinct distinction actually even before comment uh, 25. Uh, uh, which, which builds on that opinion of the Lanzarote Committee. And in this report, again, the committee draws uh, importance to states because it found that only 11 out of the 43 countries that it had examined uh, specifically addressed child self-generated images and videos or sexual content produced by children in its legislation and more importantly, does not make the distinction between when that is coerced, uh, the self-generation, or when it is part of a, a, a private uh, consensual relationship between children of uh, similar uh, ages uh, uh, and maturity, or persons of similar ages and maturity. So the committee uh, really asked for that to be fixed in the legislation, and we will see the recommendations later on. Uh, so I wanted to point out that as far as the coercive behavior is concerned, and when adults are, um, are uh, exploiting the fact that they have uh, in their possession a uh, child self-generated image and use that to ask for more such images or for a financial gain or for other sexual purposes, uh, the legislation that we have uh, looked into um, of these 43 countries, only one country has a, a, a clear uh, self-standing sexual offense for this uh, specific uh, behavior, criminal behavior. So the committee has uh, uh, encouraged strongly the states, parties to the convention and in general as a benchmark for any country wanting to combat this uh, increasingly uh, uh, this increasing phenomena is that of creating a self-standing sexual offense because it is uh, generally addressed in the legislation of the countries we have examined 
um, by uh, concurring offenses, which does not uh, facilitate the investigation and prosecution and putting the best interest of the child uh, uh, at the forefront and the speedy uh, uh, also intervention of, of the support and the assistance, etc. So these are uh, two very important uh, um, uh, findings that um, there is really a very low number of countries which in its legislation contemplates behavior around child self-generated images and videos of a sexual nature. Um, because in most legislation, the terminology used is still old terminology, which the committee has also recommended to move away from, which is the terminology of child pornography. So the committee really insists that this terminology should be abandoned as soon as an opportunity arises to modify legislation. One should insert the terminology of child abuse material. And in, in that context, a distinction should be made when children are producing and possessing and sharing among themselves for their own private use uh, sexualized images, um, this behavior does not amount, is not related to behavior which is connected with the production, possession and uh, transmission of child uh, abuse material because it is part of their sexual development. However, when that uh, is part of a uh, uh, of an exploitative uh, uh, behavior, uh, even, uh, for example, in the context of grooming uh, or uh, pornographic performances which involve uh, children, then in such cases the children should be, children should be immediately addressed to support, help, and the perpetrators should be prosecuted, uh, as uh, uh, Sonia has also uh, said uh, before me. I just would like to conclude by saying, like Hazel, that in this uh, monitoring process, the committee involved children and the children we involved to share their experience and give their recommendations, uh, raised all of the same points that Hazel has put forward. So children uh, participating in Europe uh, had the same uh, uh, issues and main recommendations as those uh, that Hazel has put forward. Most importantly, they are calling for um, sexuality education, which is not focused on uh, scaring them off uh, certain behaviors, but um, empowering them to understand how to better protect themselves while uh, developing their sexuality and also the need to have uh, apps or uh, videos or easily accessible uh, tools online to report when uh, they become victims of uh, exploitation uh, so that uh, those images can be taken down. And I think other speakers will uh, address the question which was raised concerning whether there is legislation uh, or obligations in legislation uh, as uh, to the automatic detection and removal of abusive material. I can just hint at the fact that this is definitely a topic which is extremely uh, on the high on the agenda in, in Europe and beyond currently. Uh, in the context of the European Union, uh, there is a proposal for uh, regulation to require that this uh, um, content be removed by the private uh, um, uh, sector uh, industry, the industry uh, which uh, where the platforms where this material is to be found. But probably there is, uh, this will be dwelt upon later. It was not part of the uh, analysis that the Lanzarote Committee carried out of, over the past years, uh, which uh, occurred uh, when this proposal was actually coming up uh, and therefore it will be to be seen how that is dealt with uh, in, in the near future once it is enforced. But for sure, this requirement is not yet embedded in legislation throughout the European countries and therefore it is important that it will be spelled out uh, in the regulation which is coming uh, is being negotiated currently and uh, that um, the obligations of those involved are clear 
uh, and uh, that there's necessary safeguards uh, for the respect uh, of all the fundamental rights involved are embedded in, in, the, in the procedure and the requirements that will be put forward. Yeah. I think that for the moment I will stop here because I, I will then come back to you later on with main recommendations. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you, Joya, for giving us that overview and also for for the very useful work the Lanzarote Committee have been doing in this regard, because otherwise we would not know how the leg legal situation uh, in regard of self-generated sexualized content is in various countries. Um, we. I have seen that we have people in the Zoom meeting that have already raised their hand. Sophie, could you please tell us the names because the technical supporters uh, need to know whom they should open the, the floor so, and the microphone so that they can come in with their intervention. And then later on we go to the perspective from the South African youth. But firstly, let's stick a little bit more to the legislation question. Um, actually, I cannot see anybody's hand raised in my view. Um, I thought I had seen an insert in, in the Zoom meeting, but I know that, that Martin, Martin should be there, who wanted to talk about the German legislation, which is currently under review in this regard. And then also Stella Ann, uh, who is on our list of speakers, but she wanted to speak uh, step in here also with the uh, legislation in Asia. Is Martin in the room? Can anybody help me? Um, I have seen him. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, ah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes, I had uh, trouble unmuting. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you very really well. Hi, Martin. Hello, uh, my name is Martin Bregenzer. I work at the Safer Internet Center in Germany. Thank you very much for having me. I'm um, here today. I was asked to give a little review of a meeting we had uh, last week. It was organized by the German Kinderhilfswerk. Uh, Jutta, you have to help me. It's a children, um, what's the English translation? Children's Charity Fund, right? German Children's Fund, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we had a working group meeting uh, on the topic of uh, sexting and the exchange of self-generated content. And the meeting consisted of uh, two short lectures by a psychologist and by a lawyer giving their perspectives on the topic. And um, the two lectures were followed by a discussion. Uh, so what were the main takeaways from our meeting? Um, for me, the main takeaway um, from the uh, first input by a psychologist was that we should really be careful not to disproportionately focus on the problems and the negative sides of teenagers engaging in sexting. Yes, everybody agrees that uh, there are risks you take when you engage in sexting and uh, people that encounter problems such as non-consensual sharing of their pictures, for example, those people, of course, should receive proper help. However, the majority of people does not make such negative experiences. On the contrary, sexting can be seen as a regular and uh, healthy part of sexual development of teenagers. And um, especially in my line of work, which is uh, child protection and raising awareness for all the uh, problems and all the scary stuff you can encounter on the Internet, it's sometimes quite hard to, to take a step back and uh, take a look at the bigger picture and not only focus on the um, problems, but also see the positive aspects. Uh, the second input was focused on the current situation in uh, Germany when it comes to prosecution. Uh, it's a quite complicated matter. Um, I cannot discuss it in full detail here, but uh, I will try to, to sum it up. So uh, basically, since last year, possession of pictures depicting minors in sexual situations is a crime. And this means uh, the minimum sentence for this is one year in prison. 
There are cases where you can engage in sexting as a minor and not be persecuted uh, for a crime. However, there are also many cases uh, where uh, teenagers and children are committing a crime when they engage in sexting. It's uh, when you look at it in detail, it's a quite absurd situation. And luckily, since the new law uh, came into effect last year, it slowly but surely dawned on the people that this was a really bad idea. So uh, now chances are quite good that we will see a revision of said law in the near future. But at the moment, we have to deal with the situation as it is right now. And for our discussion, after the two, uh, two inputs, um, we focused on the aspect of empowering children. How can we protect children from harm, but also respect their rights to um, a regular and healthy sexual development, which includes sexting for some of them. Also, one of my fellow members um, of the working group uh, pointed out that sexting can play an important part for persons of the LGBTQ community. For example, if you um, cannot reveal your sexual identity due to fear of repression from your family or from your peers, uh, going online and um, finding a partner there may be your only choice. As I said, in Germany, the uh, emphasis uh, when talking about sexting is on the risks, mostly. And that was also our question that I was asked to post here at the um, Internet Governance Forum. Where we can get answers and ideas from all around the world. Do you know about any resources or projects that talk about sexting in an empowering and non condescending way to teenagers? We would be very pleased to hear your opinion. Uh, and I'll make sure to share any ideas with my fellow members of the working group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for this input from the, I would say, German local hub that had their meeting uh, a week ago. Um, and I do think this fits very well into the input that we now get from South African youth. De Bojo, I hope I spelled that correctly. Are you there? And could you please give us an impression from the situation there? Hello, everyone. Hi, Yuta. I hope uh, that you can um, hear me. Am I audible? Please let me know if I'm there we go. There we go. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Debojo. As Yuta had indicated, uh, I'm from South Africa, representing the whole of at the African continent, no pressure. Um, and I am from the Austrian Trade Commission, but I also work with a nonprofit organization called young aspiring thinkers and we do uh, we work with a lot of young people um, in their teenage years from grades 9 until 12 which is the last grade of, of high school and we interact with a lot of youth I mean last year this year only we only we interacted with about 2,000 learners so um, this is an important aspect that we also should be looking into. We do address this off, but I think we don't necessarily address um, the sexualized aspect of the self, which is an important aspect of a learner or of a young person. We cannot even um, address the entire individual without also addressing that aspect. So it's a very important discussion that we're having. Um, so to give you a perspective of South Africa, in South Africa, these kind of um, the, the, the increased access to um, the internet, for example, has definitely propelled um, laws such as the one that has brought us here, as well as the law um, in South Africa, the Sexual Offences Act, to be reformed or to be looked over in order to address um, the learners or young people as active agents. In, um, in this space that we're talking about. So in South Africa, um, there's a law reform commission that was um, created in order to address these gaps that actually exist because of the increased access in, um, in internet uh, or in um, the internet space, as well as um, yeah, these reforms of uh, are, are, are ones that were created for the Sexual Offences Act, which is the only act that we have that um, addresses or governs sexual offences in South Africa. So these reforms are, or this commission had 11 recommendations 
that were formulated in order to address these gaps or to bridge the gaps that were currently created. Um, but in in South Africa and as well as in the rest of the continent, I think it's it gets a bit more complex. And the reason I say this is because we have an issue of um, an increased access of 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 these um, this infrastructure, but also the issue of that's compounded by the culture of silence. Um, there's a lot of young people that are not speaking up. There's a lot of young people that are not having conversations with their elders, and this is a cultural issue, right? Um, if there aren't any, or there, at least there aren't enough open conversations that are happening with caregivers, there aren't any open conversations that are happening with trusted individuals such as teachers. It's not in our curriculums. It's not. Um, being implemented in those kind of spaces that are supposed to be trusted spaces wherein this kind of engagement has to happen. So if I were to give an example, um, there was a study that was done by the UNICEF um, as well as Interpol where it speaks about 200,000 learners between the ages of 12 and 17 in Tanzania alone um, have been sexually abused and have been coerced to create sexual content um, online, whether it's by their own peers or whether it's by uh, an active individual or an older individual. Um, that kind of example makes you think that um, there are close conversations that are not happening inside the household. There are conversations that are not happening that are educative. Right, because we live in a society that is very black and white. It's a carrot and stick society. It's not so much educative and reparative. So uh, this legislation, for example, in South Africa and the one that has brought us all together, kind of forces us to to do a lot of reform work, um, but not necess but necessarily to move from wrong and right to uh, create a space wherein these discussions that are open, that are happening, um, and ask questions such as, what happened? What made you take part in such such a, an act? Um, how do we then teach and capacitate these learners as or these um, young people as active agents or active participants in this space? Because they really are active participants. They're not just in Jesus anymore, right? And um, and. How do we teach and capacitate the learner to understand that the effects, right, the effects of producing, the effects of coercing, the effects of participating in um, self-generated sexualized content, um, the magnitude of these effects, uh, the, the, the carrot and stick that actually takes place in the magnitude of the effects, um, the formulation of teaching and learning environments how do we then, what kind of individuals do we bring in to teach learners and capacitate them in order to understand um, the, the effects of what they're doing, and as well as uh, reparative measures. How do these reparative measures look like? And are they protecting the victims, or are they then, um, then making the victims feel less than? So it's a discussion that has to be had in depth um, locally, by locally, I mean in a minute way in the families and um, also in, in a much broader spectrum, which is um, legislatively, but it's definitely a very important discussion globally. Thank you, Deborah. That was very really interesting, especially about the, the cultural differences uh, with young people not talking about to, to uh, their parents or their teachers or even among themselves uh, about the issue. I'm looking around in the room and I see someone who wants to, to add something. And then for the technician, could you please then open the microphone for Stella? Stella Ann, but first you're on the floor and please introduce you. Yeah, so I'm uh, Jacqueline Lampe. I'm the CEO of RW Media, and RW Media is facilitating uh, large digital communities of young people bring young people together and create a safe space to talk about taboos and uh, sensitive topics. And based on the question of Martin, but also on um, what uh, Tebogo talked about, I would just like to mention Love Matters because it is a, an, uh, an online community um, active in over six countries, uh, having uh, more than uh, five million um, um, active followers on, on Facebook, but uh, we're big on Instagram, YouTube and what have you. 
uh, operating in um, uh, um, the Arab world, uh, Love Matters Arabic, uh, but also operating in uh, in Kenya and partnering in uh, South Africa with uh, Choma, for instance. Uh, Choma, for instance. And what we know is that if you use the language you young people use themselves, and you use pleasure positive language, young people are uh, much more attracted to what you, the content you're sharing. We talk about love, sex, and relationships. It um, um, gives the opportunity to attract more than one and a half times more young people. And in the end, they stay on longer on, uh, on our social media content. And uh, they uh, also, um, uh, how do you say it, um, end up on our uh, sex ad pages. So in the end, uh, by using uh, fun content, you still are able to give them the right messages on how to protect them themselves and how to uh, make sure that they uh, they take the rights uh, mm -hmm. uh, they have in love, sex and relationships. And um, Love Matters, uh, you can find it on rnwmedia.org um, and it's really an, uh, an inspiring uh, yeah, uh, community. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. We You can give me the link to that uh, site and put it in for the session. That would I be will. very useful. And it links directly to, to the next uh, part of the session, which answers to further national policies and transnational strategies provide. But for, before we go to that, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I think there's some issues with my video, but I'll just continue sharing anyway. So thank you so much for the invitation. I'll be speaking from a perspective of ASEAN youth per, uh, particularly. So just to cover uh, current national frameworks across ASEAN, there are issues regarding the inconsistency of definition. So like a previous speaker mentioned, use of terminology that may be a little outdated like, or, or it does not cover the complexities of our current situation, which is uh, child pornography and no clear mention of like terms like self-generated. However, there is a little hope. We do have an ASEAN regional plan for action and it does cover uh, self-generated uh, sexualized content, but there is no concretion of it across uh, ASEAN nations framework. As for uh, specifically the country where I'm from, Malaysia, so it has one of the highest internet penetration rates in the region, but uh, issues of regarding the legislation are quite, uh, quite fraught because there's issue with um, the clear age of consent. There's also issue regarding possession of child uh, pornography. There's no clear definition or punishment as an offense. And across the board, across the region, uh, member states uh, only a few of them, or three out of the ten, are actively part of international alliances to combat issues like this. So from a legal perspective, we do see that um, there may be a lot of questions when a youth wants to look at what is what is available there in terms of the law, like does the law really protect our interests, etc. And when I think of it as a youth, um, maybe perhaps beyond the child stage, I would also like to mention that in an ending harm report, there was a mention of um, a culture where some people feel that uh, children or youths, minors who have already proceeded with this self-generated sexualized content, if it comes back around to become a threat to them, uh, they believe that this is a as a you know a fault of the victim themselves. So it results in a in a sort of stigma to share that you were also involved in such an activity and even when you are facing threats or uh, extortion, blackmail, etc. Also, at risk of being uh, ridiculed or harassed by your own peers because they do feel that it was your own fault that you actually went that far in any in any context. Yeah, that's just what I wanted to share. And my question would be, in general, um, does anyone, do any of the previous speakers believe that the global South um, will ultimately always have, uh, you know, s slower progress in terms of closing the gap between, you know, properly defining things? And would we always want? Would we always be look, looking to like try and emulate uh, frameworks from like perhaps the European countries or North Northern American continent? Yeah. Yeah, Stella. Thank you again to you. Uh, I think I will get back to that question: Who is looking to whom uh, in regard of legislation and also strategies at the end of the session? Because it is very important to have a look at that uh, strategies that we are following there.
But for the moment, I would like to welcome Chloe Setter from the We Protect Global Alliance. And uh, please, could you open for Chloe uh, the microphone? And she will present us what um, what the We Protect Global Alliance is and what strategies they are following. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Wonderful. Okay. Chloe, please go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. My name is Chloe Setter. I'm the Head of Advocacy, Policy and Research at We Protect Global Alliance. I'm really delighted to be here with you all today. Um, when we take a look through at, at the issue of child sexual abuse online, um, obviously we know that as children have got more access to, to technology and children have, are doing so younger, um, plus an increase in the number of chat platforms and the, and the sort of complexity a knowledge um, that offenders now deploy, um, we see that this is an in a problem that is increasing rapidly, which is a, a big concern for all of us um, here today. But we, as an alliance, are trying to shift this sort of narrative away from this being an, an inevitable consequence of connected technology towards something that is a preventable problem. In terms of child sexual abuse online, we do um, something called a global threat assessment every two years. And this is a, a kind of breaks down critical trends related to abuse online. And our 2021 global threat assessment found that child self-generated material comprised a, an increasing proportion um, of the content that was being detected. Um, we also found that the COVID-19 pandemic had created a, a sort of perfect storm um, for the increase in this type of content, um, partly because children were spending more time online um, and also because there were reduced opportunities for offenders to commit in-person abuse. And also identified was the commercial drivers, the sort of um, ability for young people to potentially make money um, out of sharing and creating content. Um, and also again, linked to the pandemic, um, an increase in, in sort of poverty um, in particular areas that led us to be very concerned about this creating a kind of perfect storm of conditions um, to increase the more dangerous side of, of child sexual abuse, uh, child self-generated child sexual abuse. So when we look at some just I wanted to give some statistics just by way of background. Um, the Internet Watch Foundation, a member of We Protect, um, found in tw the first six months of 2022 almost 20,000 reports of content of self-generated material. Um, and there were incidents involving seven to 10 year olds, um, which surged by two thirds in the first six months of this year. Um, the largest age group in that, in that data is 11 to 13 year olds. Uh, and the majority of victims are girls, but they are seeing a sharp rise in the number of boys. Another member of our Thorn does a regular survey in the US, um, it's US only, but um, they have found that two and three victims of, of sextortion where children are being forced to create this um, content are girls under 16. So evidence suggests, as we've heard, that sharing sexual images is not an uncommon practice for young people. However, we do also know some children are more likely to be pressured into doing so um, and that some children are at risk for non-sexual sharing. In many cases, children are manipulated and coerced by adults into live streaming this type of abuse across videos. Um, and then that creates more content in terms of videos and screenshots, which can be shared um, by offenders. Um, we, I won't go into this too much because I feel like Sonia covered this in the first half. But this is a good, I think, a good visual representation of how um, how this issue can be summarized, which is a very complex one, um, one that I sometimes struggle to explain to people. Um, but I feel like this is a useful graphic um, where you can see there are kind of, in terms of the harm that can come out of this, obviously, as we've said, it's not always a harmful activity for young people. Um, but when we are talking about the harm, um, there are three different kind of ways um, which that can be um, manipulated. Um, so the, the non-sexual material, which is, for example, a child innocently uh, playing on the beach in their 
in the in not wearing many clothes and that can be mispurposed and misused by offenders there's obviously the incidences where children are, are voluntarily in an age-appropriate way um, sharing with another adolescent um, self-generated material but that can be shared against their will um, and then finally the coercion or the sextortion um, where a child is groomed or tricked or forced into uh, sharing that material and that can happen by obviously a peer or an adult so it's quite a complicated area when we say self-generated material it, it encapsulates a wide range of different um, experiences from young people um, and there's often no clear consensus on what is a, an appropriate response. We've heard from Joya about the types of legislation, um, but in terms of the practitioner response, um, what, what should teachers, parents, police and others do? Um, we know that in many countries, this is creating huge challenges um, because of a lack of clarity. Um, and so we, uh, we protect, we believe that legal provisions should be in place to protect children from criminal liability in cases where um, it is appropriate and where it's intent, uh, intended solely for their own private use um, and in the correct age categories. Um, we're currently doing some research ourselves, working uh, to speak to young people, participatory research in three countries, in Ghana, in Thailand and in Ireland. And that's speaking to young people about um, what their views are on what they call sexting or sharing nudes. Um, and what they think could be helpful in terms of solutions by governments and tech platforms. We'll be publishing this in the first half of, of 2023. In terms of the response, and I know I wanted to talk a little bit about the strategic response to this topic. Um, so we protect, for those of you who don't know, we bring together more than 300 members of government, civil society and the private sector um, to focus specifically on child sexual abuse online. Um, we produce, um, we use kind of themes, these are the six main themes that we use to break down the different elements of an effective response, an effective system-wide response to child sexual abuse online, um, in terms of producing evidence, uh, supporting and protecting young people and using the voices of young people and survivors to advocate for change, in terms of ensuring there's a blueprint for laws, um, for national strategies, uh, for supporting tech members to adhere to a common and transparent approach to reporting and implementing uh, uh, tools to prevent it happening in the first place. Uh, the criminal justice response in terms of having a, a common standards for databases and common terminologies and reporting technologies and also that broader societal cultural response about how we as the public understand how children use technology, um, how children want, the, how children can ask and want for platforms to be safer. And underpinning all of that is international collaboration um, and in terms of making sure that there's all the all, all the relevant organizations are working together. Um, just do this. Fine, in fact, I'm on the final one, don't worry. Um, so we have um, to guide this response, um, a national framework called the Model National Response, which is a blueprint for governments to help guide assessment, prioritization and the, and the response and also a global strategic response, which was about looking at that international nature and how we can coordinate across across governments. But these are kind of the core five recommendations in terms of tackling this issue. Um, and, I will, and I'm aware I'm, I'm slightly over time, so I will finish there and hopefully be able to answer any questions that anyone has. Yes, thank you, Chloe, for this presentation and for giving us uh, an insight in the really important work that we protect global alliance is doing around the world um, we have on the list now the question how can young people themselves help design appropriate approaches and i would like again look around the room if anybody in the room would like to take the floor and tell us about what approaches you think would be appropriate to address the issue So if no one would, you, you would like? Yeah. Uh, you are a bit reluctant, but <laughs> please take the floor and uh, introduce yeah. yourself. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this interesting uh, topic and interesting session. For all, uh, uh, maybe uh, I had a couple of questions, but um, I, I've got, I've got the, 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 the response. 
Um, uh, but uh, uh, I'd like to answer you about how to how um, how can we get involved uh, or involve uh, uh, people more and more in this topic and to protect mm -hmm. uh, children's uh, uh, children and to protect to, to protect uh, uh, this uh, this um, uh, to, pro to protect our children in general. So. Um, I think uh, uh, the most important thing to be done uh, is to involve more and more uh, association and uh, organizations like uh, like sport uh, sport teams like uh, uh, NGOs that uh, are uh, in charge of uh, child cultural culture child uh, 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 travels uh, and so on. This is, I think, uh, uh, one of the one, one of the important ideas. I, I think to to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's Thank it. you so much. Anyone else in the room who has uh, to report about approaches? Yes, please take the floor and introduce yourself. Hello. Um, hello, everyone, and also thank you for giving me a floor to ask. Uh, to provide some opinion on that. Uh, actually, um, I'm Piu, sorry, I forgot to <laughs> introduce myself. I'm Piu from Myanmar, and um, I think uh, we have to think about in the different way, uh, because very recently um, um, I found the community-based domain for the uh, children uh, for creating the uh, safe space for them. So that would be uh, one of the solution for protecting the children uh, from the hamming themselves from the content moderation as well. For example, like a uh, target domain was developed by the Door Asia organization. And I recently found like uh, it is a good idea to protect the children and also to create the safe space for the children as well from the technical perspectives. Uh, also, I think uh, that kinds of initiatives uh, should be more supported uh, because uh, if we can create the domain uh, for the children and create the space for the children, and uh, but that domain has to be based on the community <laughs> as well. That would be the another idea uh, how we can solve and address uh, that, uh, to protect our children and the children rights as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that input. And I do think we will have another session also where we will talk about the dot kids domain and how we can make that uh, the gener uh, gener sorry, the generic top level domain a safe space for children as well, but that is within another session. Um, Hazel and Deborah Ho, do you have anything to add from the youth perspective? Um, yes, um, I think um, I'll echo what the first point of Kyo. What is important is the, that children will be given a space in decision making processes. And children from different backgrounds should be, invo should be involved because children are not homogeneous. It is crucial that children from different situations and circumstances will be given a space and that their involvement will be meaningful. I heard uh, recently from another speaker in another uh, engagement that digital service providers tend to design approaches for a perfect family with present and supportive adults who can readily provide support to children. But that is not always the case. We should take into consideration the nuances. In Asia, for example, we have uh, a number of children left behind by migrant parents because uh, that's uh, one of the characteristics of the region. Migrant parents are, uh, parents are migrating in order to earn money and children are left uh, uh, for care of uh, grandparents or other um, other adults, you know, you know, other relatives. So we should take into consideration those nuances. And I also touched on this earlier, but I wanted to add to add another detail. What service providers can do is to provide uh, accessible, child-friendly, and high-quality information to children. Children go online to find answers to questions, including about health or relationships, that are difficult to ask offline because these are issues that are often considered taboo in their culture or questions that adults perceive that children should not be asking, as Tabogo shared. 
So they are afraid to ask their parents or teachers about these things, so they go online for information. So this, this means that uh, we need to ensure that children have access to high quality information online. We should address the online misinformation and disinformation, including on sexual and reproductive health and rights and sexuality and relationships. And we should also develop children's digital literacy, which includes uh, critical thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. And Can I just... Deborah, please take the floor. Um, just to add on to the amazing points that Hazel um, spoke about, I think that it is definitely collaborative effort and it is not a one-size-fits-all um, solution or approach that we need to develop. It has to be context-specific. So what happens in South Africa will definitely not be the most um, feasible or most implementable um, thing that would happen in Zambia, and that's our neighboring country as an example, because there are different in, in, in the context and the way in which we operate and and and. So it definitely has to be a collaborative effort. Um, and it has to, like I had said um, initially, it has to create, it has to be an environment of an open and honest conversation that has to be had with the different stakeholders that form part of the life of the minor. Um, and I think that in all honesty, because this conversation is not being had in the um, in a public domain and a lot of young kids from the ages of 10 actually do go to like porn sites or sexual contact sites in order to get information. So it just goes to show that the immediate caregivers or the immediate trusted individuals or entities are not the most reliable because, and it could also be a cultural thing, right? So adding individuals or experts such as sexologists in the life orientation plus life orientation is a subject in South Africa wherein it teaches learners about life. So anything relating to life, but it doesn't touch on sex or it doesn't touch about the sexual being of the learner. So now that becomes a huge problem because you ask yourself then that means it doesn't it doesn't address the, the learner as a whole or the young person as a whole. So where do they go? They go to these online sites because those are the most easy to access. And then it, it begs the question of then what are the parents saying when a learner or when a child accesses these sites? Parents don't even know, don't even have a clue what they, their kids are having. So what does control look like um, in the most healthiest way ever? Control in the tech gadgets, control in the, the, the access that they have online. And what are big tech companies also saying in terms of, um, and that's a question that um, was asked on the floor as well. What are big tech companies It looks like you are frozen, uh, Deboho. So I, I think that we are out of running out of time. Oh, we can see the transcript, but no, we can't hear we'll just you. Just this up, let me discuss it. Okay, thank you. I think we we are running out of time. So thank you so much for giving uh, us again your input to the session. Um, we will now turn again to Sonia Livingston and then Joya Scapucci from the Council of Europe because we are here at the Internet Governance Forum and I'm really convinced that all these questions are related to Internet Governance and that we need to look what Internet Governance can do to support a common approach in respect of different political systems and cultural backgrounds that we have already heard about. And um, Sonia and also Joya, if you could also please help to answer the question that was the first question in the room, how can we hold platform providers accountable and could gov internet governance uh, give some input into that debate, how accountable they are, uh, which responsibility uh, the platform providers uh, could take and which uh, precautionary measures they could undertake. So to n not to, to uh, have these situations with young people being criminalized in a certain way. Sonia, the floor is yours now again. Uh, thank you so much. This has been a really uh, fascinating debate. Um, I just wanted to read the uh, very short paragraph from uh, General Comment uh, 25, specifically on the question of self-generated uh, sexual material, which says, 
self-generated sexual material by children that they possess and or share with their consent and solely for their own private use should not be criminalized and child-friendly channels should be created to allow children to safely seek advice and assistance where it relates to self-generated sexually explicit content. So I, I, I want to, um, I, I mean, the rest of the general comment has many answers to the question that Jutta Krull um, uh, raised about both the options available to the state and the options, um, the recommendations to business. But I really just wanted to emphasize that the implication of, of paragraph um, 118 in the general comment is that it really only um, sexually generated content only relates to that which is done um, with consent um, and is appropriate to the young person's evolving capacity. And I do think it might help this conversation if we didn't use the word self-generated at all in relation to uh, situations of coercion and or exploitation. And the general comment refers to those as technologically um, facilitated forms of exploitation um, and abuse. And I think that notion of technological facilitation captures the way in which um, an abuser is uh, remote from the physical situation without the implication and the it'll always be possible to misinterpret if we call um, an abusive situation in some sense down to the child themselves. So I would, on, on listening to the kind of two conversations in a way that we've been having here, what, how do we respect um, the sexual rights and sexual expression of uh, emerging adults, as the psychologists would say, and how do we respect what young people themselves want in that regard? And how do we keep that really very different um, and distinct from exploitative situations, bearing in mind, um, as, as, as has been said before, that all images can be abused um, uh, in being uh, shared away from their original uh, original use and original uh, context. Uh, so, so we are talking about some very different kinds of, of, of situations. Um, General comment 25, I think, you know, lays out a whole host of things that both states and businesses should do. Both um, should begin all policy processes with a child rights impact assessment. I think that would um, just bring together child consultation, a holistic approach to child rights, a recognition of the different uh, issues that have to be addressed and put them um, um, on, at the forefront of the agenda before a policy or before a new product is uh, released and, 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 and becomes, becomes a fact in the world. So child rights impact assessments captures many things that you know, if we did that, I think many, many, many things would be uh, greatly uh, improved. Um, but clearly there is a, a very um, important relationship uh, to be uh, clarified uh, in legislation about the relation between when law enforce enforcement gets involved and I, I take some hope from the Council of Europe charting that you know the, the, the it, it's now clear what should be done the the challenge in a way is one of implementation states need to transform their language be more much more careful in the in the distinctions they make about what is with consent and what is under coercion um, and then give much clearer guidance law enforcement for what they and 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 not and also of course uh, civil society and the state have a very important um, role to play um, in relation to providing help opportunities for those open and honest conversations that we have been discussing uh, today and ensuring that children do have access to to support um, whether they need it um, because a, 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 as it were a consensual situation has gone wrong or whether they need it because they find themselves in in a situation of coercion and and exploitation so um, businesses, um, uh, it remains an open conversation, I think. What General Comment 25 calls for is that this should be a very active dialogue, that we need a very multi-stakeholder dialogue. Clearly, business does have unique forms of knowledge. It, it and only it knows when one um, actually or potentially abusive adult is contacting multiple children across um, multiple um, circumstances. That's the, that's the kind of unique data 
that we need them to harness with transparency and in collaboration. But I don't think anyone wants business to be um, the kind of the last uh, port of call for safeguarding children. I think that we, we do want that responsibility to uh, stay with the state uh, and with the oversight of civil society. Thank you so much, Sonia. We have again a question from the floor. So is it addressed to Sonia? Then please yes, go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, hi, Sonia. Thank you very much uh, for your insights. So my question is about actually the idea of consent. Because what we believe is that as people who work in women's rights and children's rights is that it is also problematic to gain consent from children, uh, to generate consent as also abuse. So how do you define consent? And considering that there are different age differences and across countries, there is no one homogeneous description of sexual abuse, right? So when you go to Egypt um, at, until a certain time, it was not criminalized domestic abuse, whereas when you go to Sweden, you see a lot different ideas on what consent is. Um, even in a consensual sexual relationship among adults, you, you can con be conducting rape, let's say, if you're not um, informing your partner about your protection. So, so we see that there are a lot of differences among legislation. Um, so that's, that's number one part, I think, that's um, that interface, how you suggest we address it. And secondly, I think one of the issues that I'm really curious about your opinion is privacy. So based off in Turkey, we had a project about from a company called the pedomap.live, which was giving quite live information about every single second that child sexual abuse imagery was downloaded, uh, child exploitation imagery was downloaded. However, the site has to be, had to be taken down because the governments in the European Union was like, it's great that you're finding those, but we can't act on them because our privacy laws do not allow us to go actually against those people. So um, this might be a, a bit um, detailed, mate, but I'm really interested about your idea of how you define consent when you're trying to do actions among uh, different countries and different actions, and how would privacy laws um, be, be applied to those. So thank you. Yes, thank you for that question. Sonia, would you like to take it? Would you be able to take it? Um, I'm, I'm um, well, I'm happy to offer uh, some thoughts. Uh, Great. I, I think one of the, one of the really difficult uh, issues here, and, and, and I uh, think Joya and others will also want to come in on this point, um, is that we, um, the, the situations you described in a way are just um, overly uh, simplified. Of course, the questions of every country has, uh, most countries have already a law on, on the question of consent and sexual consent, and it's embedded in many ways in the law, in ways that are understood, but always understood according to a child's evolving capacity and context. So the problem arises in a way in the digital world in relation to internet governance, either because as those of us sitting in civil society, we don't have access to the knowledge and the nuance of the particular um, platforms or online circumstances in which interactions occur, um, or we haven't yet developed um, uh, sufficiently nuanced responses to them. And so we call for platforms to ban or restrict or allow um, in a very kind of crude way. So in a way, we, we're just at, a, we're at an early stage of the debate and we need to speed it up because, because children's um, well-being is, is at stake. Um, but um, I, I, I go back to the idea that the notion of sexual consent, I think in both the cases you described, you described um, it as abuse in Egypt and as um, uh, with a more nuanced notion of consent in Sweden. Um, I think actually um, there is less ambiguity um, uh, about uh, when children can um, give uh, consent and under what circumstances. Um, but it will require a nuanced decision that I think we do not want platforms to be making. Um, and I would say the same on, on, on the question of privacy in a way that was a kind of an overly simplified um, account. Clearly, many countries have privacy and data protection regulation that does enable um, uh, the identification of um, actual or potential abusers, but the particular case described seemed to me um, to be going about it the wrong way. And actually, we already have many practices that do um, uh, identify um, abusers in, with more subtlety and, and in accordance with data protection regulation. So I think we need to be just very careful not to look for simple overarching solutions in in relation to fantastically complex 
problems and we do need a more nuanced um, language uh, to discuss the technological spaces and interactions that are um, at the heart of facilitating some of these abuses. Thank you, Sonia. And I think it, it it's perfectly fits in that we hand over now to Joya because Joya, you have already referenced in your entry statement to the um, CISAM regulation that is uh, on the table from the European Commission and that is of course dealing with the question whether privacy could be given priority over child protection or the other way around or whether we find a balanced approach to both. So Joya, you have again five minutes. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. I will be uh, brief. First of all, I would like to say that it's not a question of which rights have precedence over others. It's a question of finding the right balance and uh, respecting all of the rights. And in this uh, specific, very complex situation, that is also possible. Uh, it is not impossible at all. Uh, because uh, there are safeguards and guarantees uh, that can be put in place in order to ensure at the same time that the children whose images are circulating against uh, uh, and are perpetrating uh, the, uh, the fact that they have undergone uh, sexual abuse and therefore are re-traumatizing them by the simple existence and knowing that they are online are taken down. And uh, uh, that can be counterbalanced with the fact that when we are not in a situation of, of abuse, obviously uh, there are data protection and privacy uh, rights that need uh, to be safeguarded and respected. And that uh, uh, when there is uh, no, um, no reason to enter, uh, or no fundamental reason to, to interfere with that, uh, that uh, should uh, not be done. And there are different kinds of technologies that can be used and the technologies which are less intrusive and respectful of the privacy uh, are those which are being considered and uh, uh, the interplay of many factors has to be taken into account. And that is uh, uh, the whole difficulty of the negotiation which is at stake. Uh, but the, the, the final aim is that of ensuring that children which have been uh, subject to uh, abuse uh, are uh, supported and helped uh, uh, also by knowing that those images are no longer there. This is something that law enforcement and uh, uh, so that states need to, to count, to, to, to factor in the policies and legislation that they are putting in place uh, in, this, in this area. And uh, it is definitely one of those areas where uh, there is uh, no single actor that can find the right solution alone. Uh, all players are important and all uh, types of cooperation at all level levels are crucial. And that is why uh, it is extremely important that the private sector is also involved in the discussions and understands uh, and contributes uh, with its uh, point of view to what is feasible and not feasible so that the right solution can can be found. So this is with respect to the, the issue of balancing rights in, in, a, in, a, in a way which is doing right to the persons that uh, uh, are the rights uh, owners. So that's uh, very important. But uh, I wanted also to reply to the question concerning what kind of uh, um, internet governance. So really, uh, what, how can the private sector uh, help uh, and empower children as the representatives in today's discussion, which were uh, speaking more from the direct experience of children and youth's point of view uh, said very clearly, it is important to multiply the possibilities for children to find information which is, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, well, explained in a way uh, uh, which is accessible for them and reflecting uh, their uh, ability to understand very complex phenomena. So it has to be uh, accessible for children, appropriate to their age, uh, and uh, very well-framed information, but also 
uh, information as regards to spaces where they can uh, speak up, report, uh, not uh, have the fear of addressing the taboos. This is what children are telling us uh, as well. And it is definitely, there is a need for putting more out there online uh, to explain and increase all of these uh, and share the uh, good practices that exist in certain countries. Uh, one of the speakers asked for examples of promising practices in the area of uh, empowering children in understanding uh, uh, um, sexting uh, in a, properly in, in a safe way. Uh, those uh, uh, promising practices are collected by uh, well, definitely the Lanzarote Committee collects uh, these promising practices just as uh, the We Protect Global Alliance, but also within the context of the We Protect Global Alliance, the Tech Coalition has made it clear that it is engaging to respect to certain uh, principles and safeguards. So it's really also uh, um, important to share this information worldwide and to make it uh, uh, accessible to the children themselves. So the, 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 the private sector can definitely help in making this more, um, more, more correct information available. And uh, to do that, it needs to be in a dialogue with the civil society and with the state uh, actors, which are act which are uh, uh, working in this in this area. And meetings like this help to um, to raise more awareness and. Uh, I will send links as well. I cannot do this on the on the on the iPad of my of my daughter, which is the only device with which I have managed to connect to the meeting. I tried with my, yeah, my computer at work, but it doesn't work. So I will send you uh, tools which already exist and that can be adapted uh, uh, also in other work in other languages, uh, because it was very important what was said by Hazel that. Uh, a lot uh, of these tools exist in English in particular, but we need to make them more known and available in an infinite number of other languages because not all children uh, understand, read uh, English, not all children actually read. So that is why we also need material which is uh, interactive and uh, uh, more child friendly in this area. Thank I you. Think I will. I will Looking at the watch, yeah. I, I would stop here and I'm happy to answer any other questions yeah. that there might uh, be. It's very I, important, I think, to avoid the misunderstanding on terminology uh, um, to uh, Joya, adhere to Joya, the we, international we benchmarks save, that exist. We, we need to save five minutes to wrap up and uh, I would yes. like to turn again to exactly. the uh, online moderator. Sophie, do we have any... Uh, questions in the chat or someone who has raised their hand? Yes, we do. We had a question in the chat, uh, which relates to what uh, Joya uh, just said, that we need safe, child-appropriate, empowering spaces. And um, Samira Damburem uh, asked, how can the issue of verification of a child's age can be handled? Um, given that some children give false age when signing up on certain platforms. Um, we're very happy that Chloe Setter already uh, answered in the chat um, and uh, gave a link with an overview of age verification uh, to answer this question of how this can be used. Thanks for that. And then we also have a raised hand from Leah Peters. I'm about to unmute you. Now, yes, so Leah, the thank floor you is very yours. much. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm uh, Leah Peters. I'm from ECPAD Germany, and like my video doesn't work right now, so apparently, so uh, it's without, but it's fine. I have a question be because we were like talking a lot about like the discussion on how to best involve the business sector, but I was wondering if there's also discussions about how to involve also the financial sector because, especially with like. Uh, online abuse via live streaming, for example, or also when we talked about uh, children seeing this like as a possibility to actually make money from like sending pictures. We know that the financial sector is like a big part that could be involved. Like, um, for example, Western Union told us that uh, it is really hard for them to uh, to report cases because of. I mean, there are indicators. Uh, 
what uh, many uh, money transfers are related to uh, possibly sexual um, exploitation or sexual abuse uh, but this still falls under like money laundering when they report it and since it's like like it, it's not compared to other money laundering a lot of money like with live streaming it's mostly around like 15 to 30 euros so it's not that much but there are indicators of why this could be like a case of sexual exploitation via for example live streaming so i was wondering if uh, like on a um, on a global level there's also discussions on how to um, on how to make this accessible for more countries for more countries and for more national legislations to also involve the financial sector and get their help in um, in prosecuting crimes. Thank you, Leah, for the question. I don't think we have anyone from the financial sector here in the room, so I would like to refer that question to a further session. We know that the financial sector is very present at this year's Internet Governance Forum and we will try to, to get in contact with them and have an exchange on uh, how far we could go with, uh, with uh, such uh, cooperation. Um, now it's my task to use the final two minutes to wrap up this session and I, first of all I would like to thank all of you, those of you who are here in the room, those of you who have been uh, participants online and especially a great thanks to all the speakers in this session. Um, we are generally asked to have a gender balanced approach in our um, IGF sessions and I was really, uh, I was wondering, we had only female speakers on this issue but when I have been looking around in the room, I saw that many male uh, males were in the room, were interested in the topic, and so I would like to encourage you to stay in contact with us so that probably next year we can have a session which is a bit more gender balanced. Um, we had the question, uh, who is looking to learn from whom and what can we learn from each other during our debate? And I do think we have got lots of ideas and input how we can uh, go further with that. And I don't think it's that uh, the Global South should always look to, to the other areas of the world. Uh, we need to look to the Global South and then better understanding that not all approaches fit in all countries. Uh, the general command number 25 gives us a really good framework because it is addressing all children's rights uh, in this regard, in regard of the digital environment. But nonetheless, such like the UN Convention also general commands address the states and then the states need to translate their obligations into national law. They are also paying attention to cultural differences and uh, to what they have on the table. So, but still we can rely on general command number 25 to give us a framework in which we can discuss all these questions. We will also continue the question of children's rights in the digital environment on Thursday morning with the dynamic coalition session uh, at 9.30, so it's very early, uh, even more early for people uh, from Europe, which is in the banquet room. And there we will uh, discuss how we can translate data and laws into a child rights-based approach. And uh, you are uh, very welcome to join that session as well. For today, now I think the session is closed. Thank you so much for your attention and have a nice evening. Bye-bye.